you about level design today. Um, so just some quick notes on my background. Um, oops, sorry. So I went to UCF in Orlando, Florida, and from a, that school I graduated and went to Terminal Reality, where I worked on Blood Rain 2 and Aeon Flux for Xbox, PlayStation 2. Strangely, I also worked on Grandma's Boy, did some tie-in stuff for the movie, and in 2005 I went to Bethesda Game Studios, where I've had the immense honor and privilege of working on Oblivion, was the lead level designer of Fallout 3, most recently worked on Skyrim. So I apologize, guys. I'm going to start my slides here. Sorry about that. So any talk like this where you want to talk about level design in broad terms is sort of a difficult thing to start on because even though level design is one of the most broadly accepted and acknowledged job titles in the industry, it's also one of the least commonly defined. And the reason for this is simple. It's just that what levels are and what level design requires is going to be a little bit different based on the project you're working on, the genre that it's in, the platform. All these little decisions mean that a level designer working on an RTS and a level designer working on an RPG or a first person shooter, these people are having very different discussions about what makes a good level for their game. As a job hunter, this just means that you need to be specific. A good exercise if you're interested in working in the industry is just go to the sites of companies you like and read the job openings and see what the requirements are and then try and understand how you can get the skills to fit those things. If you're thinking about level design as an entry level position, it is viable. One of the reasons for this is that Making levels actually isn't technically that difficult. Anybody who's comfortable with computers, is reasonable, comfortable in any sort of visual application, can learn how to make a competent, good, workable level. But there's a big gap between competent and excellent, and those intangible skills that make a really good level designer are extremely difficult to find and test for. You know, somebody who's involved in hiring for level design, this is nerve wracking, because I can look at your portfolio, I can have long conversations with you, we can go through the interview process. But it's not until we've actually gone through the trenches together and shipped a game that I really know what kind of level design you are and how good you are. But the upside of this is that once you do get that first chance to prove yourself, that talent, once it's proven and you have a reputation, you have a portfolio, is really, really valuable. And it's going to make it easy for you to find yourself in other positions of employment and doing things that you enjoy. So I talked there about how broadly defined a level designer's role can be. But I do think there are some common threads that run through all level designs that we all need to be good at. And these are things like layout, pacing, the ability to make a level that runs well, as well as just showcasing things, which is sort of my own term, and I'll explain in a little more detail later. But those things that level designers also will do, these ancillary types of duties, can range from things like scripting, visual elements, doing lighting and clutter, writing, all these are things that level designers might do at Studio A and a level designer would never do at Studio B. And so these are kind of where we get that broad variance of responsibilities. So today we'll just sort of focus on these four core pillars of level design skill sets. And the first, and for most of us, the most obvious one of these is layout. Because when we think about level design, the physical play space there tends to be the first thing that comes to mind. Something like the first War of a Mario game, which is just this process or the sequence of putting together the blocks and the pits and the enemies and all this placement, that is sort of capital L, capital D level design in a lot of our minds. But for the purposes of a sort of a high level conversation like this, I kind of have to come up with my own highfalutin hoity-toity definition, which is that a layout is the context in which the player is engaging with the mechanics of the game. So in the, in the case of like Mario, the mechanics of Mario are you run to the right and you jump. So level one, one of Mario is really good at running to the right and jumping. It presents you with things to jump on, over, uh, there's timing involved. So that becomes a nice showcase of those mechanics. And so that's a good layout for that particular game. But if you took those same mechanics and put a different character, like uh, you know, a, a stock car in a Mario level, it's not gonna work as well because that layout is crappy for driving a car and having those kinds of mechanics. And one of the things to keep in mind is that Layout matters to all games because all games have play fields, even though it might not always be obvious. And we can kind of prove this by thinking about level design and levels and layouts in terms of the perspective the player plays from. 
So where a lot of us would start intuitively is with like 3D avatar based games where the player is controlling some sort of actor or agent moving through a 3D space. It doesn't matter if it's something like Assassin's Creed, which is open, or first person shooter, platforming games, even Flower, where you're this incorporeal entity flowing around a field, there's still very much a play field and level in there where you're driving around a 3D space as an avatar. From there, it's a short jump to talk about 2D avatar based games where again, the player is controlling an actor, moving around an environment, and that level is a physical environment where you're engaging with that actor. But getting more abstract, you can go to sort of overview map games, omniscient view games, where your strategy, your tactical games, XCOM and you know, League of Legends, these games are overview games, but level design is still a very big part of those games. If you change the level in League of Legends, it affects the gameplay flow very much. But I think you can even get more abstract with this. If you consider something like Sudoku, which you would hardly think of in the same conversation as a lot of these other games, Sudoku is very much a level design game because you have this simple set of core rule mechanics and how those rule mechanics play out is entirely dependent on how the designer of that puzzle has laid those things out in relation to each other and that becomes that level. Even a game like Tetris, where we wouldn't normally think it's interesting to have a conversation about the level of design of Tetris because that's the level, right? It's a straightforward rectangle. It's actually a very successful level because it integrates itself flawlessly with the mechanics of that game. Because if you made one simple change to this level and you kept the core mechanics of Tetris, you suddenly have an entirely different game that doesn't work as well. And it actually becomes a very interesting level to think about because that version of Tetris requires a total overhaul to the mechanics to work. Even rhythm games like Rock Band or Dance Dance Revolution have level design. If you think of this game and you put this screenshot in front of a bunch of people and asked, what did the level designer do? You're going to get a lot of answers like, the level designer built and textured the stage, or did the scripting so that the actor moves and dances differently depending on how well you're doing, or animated the cameras to move around during the song. And that might be true, a level designer in many cases will have done that work, but the level design of this isn't that for me. It's actually the sequencing of the arrows and how those are presented to the player because the arrangement of a split jump and a shuffle step in a DDR game is where you're most directly engaging with the mechanics of that game and experiencing that. If you look at like Rock Band, you can think of it as a Mario level proceeding towards you where you're just jumping at the right time, like a Cannonball or a uh, Endless Runner game. Even games like Zork, which are text-based, and you might not normally think of having level design, actually have excellent level design. Just because a level design builder wouldn't sit down and make it space you explore, it's all about these spaces, their meaning, their definition, and their connectivity to each other. Games like this are really interesting because we have very elaborate mental maps that that becomes the proliferation of level design in our own minds. You can even extend this to things like choose your own adventure books, right? A choose your own adventure book has level design in terms of how the pages are arranged, the typeset. And it's more of a reach, but it just shows that there's still a play field, which is where the story or the rules of the story present themselves to the player. Minecraft, particularly when you're talking about layout, is a really interesting example because you could argue that the layouts in Minecraft are the thing that make the game the most interesting. But when you start a game in Minecraft, it's not as though you're loading up a map that a level designer spent weeks building just for you. It's generated by an algorithm. But these worlds are really, really interesting and because an algorithm made them and not a human doesn't make them any less level designed. It just means that the level design sensibility came out of the programmer who wrote this stuff and it just goes to show that no matter how you fit into a level or how you fit into a game development team, a good level design sensibility, a good sense of layout will help you make the best game possible because this is the underpinning of gameplay. And I could go on and on like this, but it's really just trying to make the point that no matter what the game is, there are play fields or layouts or levels, and these are where the player plays the game. Like, you can't put it more simply than that. And that makes this the foundational building block of any level, any game. And you can't have good flow without having a good layout. Your spaces need to just feel good to move around in, feel interesting to look at. And that gets you to where you have a good foundation for flow, which is an element of the second pillar, which is pacing. Now pacing, simply put, is just the rhythm of the level, right? The syncopation in which things happen, the tempo, the beats. Beats is a term that's commonly used for describing pacing. And if you've ever taken a creative writing class or screenwriting class or anything like that, you're familiar with Freytag's Pyramid which is just this concept of building towards a climax and denouement off the climax and so forth and so on. So a typical level could be mapped out as a Freytag's pyramid where like any other sort of, you know, but the shortest form type of story will be a series of climaxes and relaxations and climaxes, relaxations, 
that in themselves spell out kind of a longer form Freytag's pyramid. But it's important to remember that pacing isn't just about the tempo and the intensity of events that happens in your level, but the variety of those events. Now it's no secret that combat is probably your main building block for gameplay as a level designer. Games are really good at shooting, stabbing, jumping on, setting on fire. But it's important to remember that no matter how action-oriented and violent the game you're working on is, there are other things you can do. There are other kinds of beats that you can use to compose the pacing. You might be able to talk to a character or appreciate a really beautiful landscape or solve a puzzle and engage a different part of your brain. All these things can work with the combat to give you a sense of pacing and tempo. It's also important to point out that nothingness is a really good element of pacing. This is something where um, there are a lot of places you can draw similarities between music and pacing for levels. And when you're in music composition, the absence of sound is really important a thing. You know, among uh, like jazz players, there's a saying, play the rest. And that means that when you're not playing your instrument, it's just as important as when you are. And so it is with levels. This helps you specifically for experience design to build tension. When you're in a survival horror game and nothing's happened for too long and you know something's about to happen, you're far from bored. Something's going on emotionally with you and that's part of the pacing. It also just allows you to rest. If you've just had a, a period of great intensity, you want to come down off that intensity so that you can appreciate what you just overcame before you build into the next challenge. This always reminds me of a, a uh, figure of speech which I really appreciate um, called the dripping faucet design. And as far as I've been able to track this down, it goes back to 3D realms in like the mid to late 90s. The idea was that at that time period, a lot of games, particularly first person shooters, had this pace of room, hall, bang, 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 three guys dead, room, hall, bang, 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 three guys dead, over and over and over again. And it's like listening to an irritating faucet just as a all night, like at the same tempo and rhythm, and it drives you nuts. And rather than doing anything really elaborate to improve the pacing of these levels, all you have to do is just delete, like just remove some of those encounters and just use that nothingness and instantly you've created some texture because you've gotten those dips and you have an ebb and a flow to how the level paces. So if we return to that sort of freight tags arc of your specific level, your high points might be things like an ambush where a bunch of enemies attack you, fighting a new difficult enemy type for the first time as a mini boss, and then building up towards a climactic boss battle. But those valleys aren't just make the game less exciting or less fun, it's finding other things to do. So finding a station where you can configure your gun and upgrade it is very quiet and at the player's own pace, but it's part of the overall experience and it helps bring you towards that mini boss fight. And then having a puzzle where you engage your prefrontal cortex instead and you're doing something cerebral can also help you appreciate the buildup you're about to go through towards the boss battle. And as your levels will have their own pace, so too does the whole game. And in fact, we can talk about games with which we're familiar in terms of the pacing that they have. So like Gears of War is a very crunchy game, right? It's very percussive and syncopatic where you've got cover and roadie running and slamming into the cover. It has a nice meaty sound and shooting and reloading. All is very, very crunchy. That's totally different than something like Resident Evil 4. For its time, Resident Evil 4 was considered very action-packed for a survival horror game, but it has nothing uh, like the pacing of Gears of War. It's still very deliberate, very slow, lots of downtime to build up that tension and fear. And both of these games are in a pacing sense distinct from something like Jet Set Radio or a Tony Hawk game, which is all about flow and things happening very rapidly and streaming into each other. And the levels that you build for these games enforce that pacing because the levels are in themselves different facets of the range of pace, which together come together to make that overall characteristic pace of the game. And it's important to remember this because even a game like Sonic, which we think of in terms of its pacing, like that is the thing that defines Sonic, is straight ahead, forward, go, 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 never stop, loop to loop pacing, it still actually has these levels which change it up. You have the water levels which slow things down a bit. You have the boss fights where you're more static and you don't run around all the time. Or the weirdo like bonus levels that have been in all these Sonic games which just give the player something else. And this kind of change of pace that creates the pacing keeps sustained interest going. It's like if you're composing a concerto and all you ever used were staccato notes on the trumpets, right? It would just get really monotonous and repetitive and you need to throw in some strings or some percussion to make it more interesting. So from that point of view, it's important to think about where your level fits in the overall scheme of the game that you're, you and your team are trying to express. Because your level doesn't exist in isolation, it's part of a larger tapestry that you're trying to stitch together. 
One thing that is interesting to consider when you're talking about pacing, by the way, because pacing is very authorial, where you're trying to create a sense of pace for the player, is the notion of player-directed pacing. And this affects the level design, because if you think of a game like Dishonored, where the player has the ability to creep around the levels, take forever, sneak around and never be seen, or play the game in a very straight-ahead, bombastic, violent way, those levels are no longer trying to present the player with pacing, but permit the player to set the pacing themselves. That's actually one of the great strengths of level design of Dishonored, which I think is superlative, is that it gets out of the way and lets the player create the experience that they would most like to have within the range of expression the skill set or the mechanics allow. So how do you get better at this? Well, pacing is one of those things that's universal. Any medium that tells story, whether it's music or theater, novels, other games, film, they all have pacing. The good ones all have nice pacing. But you have to remember that games have their own quirks, right? If you're trying to build up to a moment of surprise, the fact that I can save crawl through it and replay it or die and have to replay it screws with that surprise. Uh, the fact that I can hit a load door because I need to transition from one pace to another can kill the sense of pacing. It just means that these are things you have to be cognizant of when you're trying to apply lessons from other medium to games and think about them because that fact that you have player agency can really mess with the idea of pacing if you're not ready for it. Something else that's nice about pacing is that it can be measured and quantified. You know, when you, when you try and chart out a Freytag's pyramid of your level, you are in a relativistic way quantifying that pacing, and then you can talk about it and talk about how maybe we can change things and make it better. I always am a little cautious when I see somebody like write an article about predictive pacing, like if you pace your levels this way, they will be this kind of interest. Um, and that's just, I think that pacing um, measurements are good yardsticks. So it's a good way to maybe not necessarily plan things, but come back to them later and then say, well, this part was successful and this part wasn't when we actually played it, and now we can sort of map out the pacing and say, oh, well, we have too many high beats right after each other and we can take one out. Because really, good pacing just requires you to think about the player, right? Particularly as a level designer, you are the person who is sort of the, the ghostly apparition of the game on the couch next to the player, where you are helping them get through the experience and get to the emotional places that are interesting from the B app. And so you have to constantly take yourself out of developer mindset and think of the game in player mindset and how they're gonna feel and then use that to guide the pacing decisions you make. When you're doing this, something that comes up a lot is the concept of player fatigue. This is a term that a lot of game developers use just to say the player is tired of shooting, the player is tired of free falling, this sequence has gone on too long. We tend to do that a lot in games where we just keep doing the same thing for too long and we just use player fatigue as a metric of people are clearly bored of this or it's becoming monotonous and we just change it up. And also the main number one thing you can do to get better at it is just play the level. A lot of designers tend to stay in the editor. If you just get out of the editor and you play your level and over and over and over again, it gets better incrementally by you making those changes and putting yourself in the player's shoes. Likewise, observational testing, just putting somebody else in front of the level and, and shutting up and just watching them, is one of the most educational things you can do as a game developer. By watching people, you can, you can uh, confirm or deny your own sort of biases and suspicions. You can collate what they say and then like look for common things against multiple players. And they make really, really well thought out iterations rather than stabbing in the dark, which a lot of us honestly do. One of the other nice things about pacing before we move on is pacing is super flexible. So imagine that you're working on a big game, big AAA production game, and you're three months out from shipping. At this point, the producers want the game to be done, it needs to be done, it needs to be stable, but one of your levels just isn't working out. It's just not as good as it could be. And if you, go, if you bring to the table an idea about, I want to change the layout, that means you need to redo all the AI markup, the pathfinding, light baking, compile your scripts, go through a full another rev of testing, but Likewise, you could say, well, what if we just changed or modified this encounter or removed this encounter where it happens? And that's usually just like a scripting change or moving some entities around the level, which means that plan B that you offer is something you could actually do, whereas the original one is something you would never be able to do without setting the game back months. So that brings us to performance, which is the next of the pillars. And performance is sort of an awkward title for this section because really this is the fine art of not making something that's just crappy, right? Like, and this is, I wouldn't say undervalued, but maybe under-discussed or under-acknowledged. 
the ability for a level designer to make a level that works is really important, it turns out. Like, the number one feature of a video game is that it runs on a computer well. And if you can't do that, you can't enjoy the game. And this is something that's worth kind of driving home to a lot of people who will be doing level design because crappy performance is the quickest route to the shelf, you know? This is something we, we in the industry often refer to this as a shelf moment, where out of frustration or apathy, you know, you're playing it and, and it's 12 frames a second in this big, you know, battle scene, and you just quit the game, and you put it on the shelf. And the thing about the shelf is games don't come back from that, right? Like, how, how often have you really taken a game you haven't finished, put it on the shelf, and come back, like, six months later and put it back in? It doesn't happen, and not, not that often. So we really don't want to end up in this situation because I don't care how face-meltingly awesome the gameplay you had put together was. If I can't play it, I won't play it. I'll never see it, and it didn't matter. You could have deleted a few of those guys and got your frame rate up, and then I would have played it, and it would have been far more awesome than the thing I never saw in the first place. If I get frustrated, if I can't, if I don't, and I won't, none of it matters. But this is more than just about you, because if I quit the game because your level ran crappy, I also don't see anybody else's work. And that's a very serious responsibility of the level designer, that you don't be the reason the game doesn't work and nobody else can play it. And the thing here is, when it comes to this sort of, you know, does the game crash, does the game run at frame rate, some people might think intuitively or might argue that this is really not level design's problem. It's up to the code. You know, the programmers need to make sure the game runs fast and the shaders compile and all this other stuff. And I don't throw in with that at all. I think it's actually kind of a cavalier, irresponsible point of view. Because when you're working on a team to make something, everyone has to pull together on that. It doesn't matter what your role is. You know, if you're a tester or, or a producer, your job when it comes to performance is to spot when it's a problem, escalate that, and communicate it so that other people on the team know. Whether it's something super obvious that's you know, in front of everyone's face or it's something really weird and esoteric because you drop in and out of a matchmaking lobby in the middle of your level, these people are responsible for making sure that the issue is known and it can be fixed in the first place. And then programming, as you would suspect, is creating the foundation on which it all works, right? They're the ones making sure that we can have reliable budgets for poly count and texture memory. And then it's up to those of us who are making content to make sure that those pieces of content fit the whole thing. Because those pieces of content are what players see, right? We don't see the code. We don't see the production schedule that was put together to make sure everything came together on time. All we see is the level content right in front of us. And if your level content is letting the player down, you've let the entire team down. And it's OK to let that be a little melodramatic, because it is serious. It's a big responsibility. So how then do you do your part? Well, the first thing is just to know the limitations, right? Know the boundaries that you can push, and know the ones that you can't really step over. A lot of this comes down to technical constraints, like what is the polygon budget? Um, what is the texture budget? What are some good scripting practices that I can do to avoid an endless loop in the game? How many guys can I put on screen before the AI stops processing? This is something that you'll see a lot in different dev studios, where level designers become these sort of MacGyvers of problem solving, because we're often the ones on the front line of, like, we break the game, and now we have to fix it. and so. An experienced designer who's been through the ringer a few times is a person who can sit there and say, OK, I hear what you're saying, but this part and this part are not going to work. This other part's good. And if we change it this way, we can make those other things that you want to do work in a slightly different variety. And what's important about that kind of institutional learned knowledge is that it helps you from just stumbling through and making a bunch of mistakes. And you can just sidestep those mistakes thanks to level designers who know how to avoid them in the first place. And it makes you, as a level designer with that knowledge, an invaluable member of your team. Another thing that you can do as a level designer is really just eating your Wheaties. There are a lot of things involved with making a level that runs well, which they're not fun to do. Setting up markup and pathfinding, optimizing your scripts, getting rid of unseen geometry or frustrum calling, all these things sort of suck. They're not fun. But they're things that you can actually do really early. And so we really try to get those things into the dev cycle as soon as possible. And the reason this is important, that we don't procrastinate, is because when you're working on a game, like, so a friend of mine says this thing where your favorite game, like imagine it for a second, the best game you've ever played, guess what? It was garbage until about six months at best from the time that it shipped. 
It wasn't fun. It doesn't matter how good the design document is. It's not until the game is just about done that we can really play it and know what works. And so a lot of times, you might have something where, like, the best thing in this game is a grenade launcher. It's super fun. And you get it for, like, 30 seconds as part of, like, a Jeep sequence. If you're scrambling at the end of your dev cycle to make your level run above 12 frames a second, you don't have the chance to work the grenade launcher into that level. So if you do this stuff early and just sort of bite the bullet, you'll have the opportunity, we actually call it opportunity time at Bethesda, to go back through the game and shine a spotlight on the things that are really good and pump those things up. Because at the end of the day, it's all about showcasing the game really well, which brings me to the fourth pillar of what makes a good level designer. And showcasing, this is not like a term you'll hear you know, across the industry, this is just me um, trying to describe one of those intangible things that makes a good LD. And it's basically the idea that the LD is the MC, okay? We take the code and we take the art and we are the lens that focuses it into a laser beam of pure experience, right? That is a big job. Again, it's worth being a little melodramatic about because if you don't present the art and the code in a good way, the player never gets to see it and that falls on the level designer. Like if you've ever have played a game where you were frustrated because this thing is really fun to do or this sort of an enemy is cool to see, but the game never sort of uncurls itself and lets you do the thing that's fun, it's usually on the level designer for not doing a good job of showcasing those parts of the game very well. And it all comes down to just accentuating the positive and then downplaying the things that are the negative. Again, this is something that's really best done towards the end of the game when you can actually make a, you know, a rational judgment based on playing a, you know, a game that's coming close to being final and then pumping things up and pushing other things down. Something else that's worth noting for um, anybody who's you know, going to be a level designer, has been a level designer, is to not undermine the core of the game. And you actually see this a lot because games take a while to make and level designers get bored or they get frustrated and they might try and work like you know, some crafting sequence into a first person shooter that they can kind of script to almost work. But a lot of games, like I know when I play games and I hit things like that, I can tell like, ah, somebody got bored and it's janky and it doesn't really work and it actually detracts from the game. And you have to remember, and this is really important, it's something I kind of hit on uh, when I'm talking about this stuff, is you have to make games for yourself the player, not yourself the developer. They are different people. And you have to always remember to make something that builds the game up and makes it better and showcases the game well, as opposed to making something that is just fun for you in the moment and might not actually be a better overall experience. So this talent, for me, actually, is what summarizes a LD best, right? Like a really good LD is somebody who has this showmanship, this ability to entertain, to look at this mess of things and arrange it in a way which has a narrative, which feels good. And it's one of those intangibles that is really hard to test for, and it really just comes out of getting out there, building content and making things, and just going through that over and over again and learning how to entertain. So, as you can see, I need to check my time. Okay, actually, I'm going a little faster than I usually do, so this is good. Um, this is sort of section B of the talk, all right? So, so far, I've been talking in very abstract, high-level terminology because I am trying to speak to all level design, which is tough to do. So, for the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk specifically about level design at Bethesda. And this will let me get a little bit more specific, talk about our process, um, and just to frame up the conversation, I'm talking about dungeons, right? Level designers do a lot of stuff at Bethesda, but the thing you most identify as level design are the dungeons you go into, and we have a lot of them, and we have a small team, so we have to have a really good process of how we approach these things, because we make, you know, 150 or 200 dungeons in a game with just six, seven people, all right? And we take a long time, but we don't take that long. So what we do is a process of taking multiple passes. You can think of this as a multi-pass system because that's kind of fun and it's easy to remember. And it is what it sounds like, right? We just take passes over and over and we iterate because, again, games are works in progress. They're not ready to go. Making a game is not the same as modding a game where you kind of, it's a known quantity and you can plus one that. You're starting from nothing most of the time. So iteration is something that you'll hear designers, game developers talk about a lot because it has a lot of benefits. When you're iterating on things and you're coming back to them in small passes over and over and over again, you're able to listen to what people have to say about it who are playing it and incorporate that feedback. You can improve on it without wasting a lot of your work. So if your layout sucks and you don't actually let anybody play it until you're done, 
changing that layout is really difficult because you have all this other stuff on top of the layout. But if I show you my layout and it sucks when there's nothing else there, I can change that or iterate on it very quickly and come to a better foundation before I keep going. Also, um, it lets us integrate new features as they come online because, again, when you start a game, nothing's really there. So by taking these multiple passes, what you'll see as I go in depth is that certain things that aren't available at pass A are available by pass C, and we'll use them at that point without having to sort of go back through a bunch of complete content and add stuff in retroactively. And the last point I'll make about it, which is just my opinion, but I think it leads to a better quality of life as a developer, uh, which you know is a serious issue, because I've worked on games before where I'm working on this level for three months and then it will be done. And then I will start on the next level for three months and it will be done. And that sucks. Like, you lose objectivity because you're just so, like, in the woods on this thing that you can't see the forest. And you get bored. You start making bad decisions. By iterating and coming back to things, because we'll put a level down for two or three months before we come back to it, you really do come back with fresh eyes. You come back with broader perspective. And it actually just is more interesting because you're always changing up. You're always doing something else. And it's very up-tempo and fast-paced. And it keeps the workplace more lively, I think. So at Bethesda, the level design passes are broken down thusly more or less. We have uh, five passes plus an art pass. I'll go into each of them in detail, starting with pass zero. So pass zero is really just sort of the pitch pass where we talk about what we would like to do. Where the game is at this point is hardly anywhere at all. So when we start on a game like Skyrim, a smaller group of developers who were uh, finished on, say, Fallout stuff sooner move over and start talking about Skyrim, and that's what we call pre-production. One of the things for level design that comes out of pre-production is this huge list. And it's a list of all the dungeons in the game, their names, the enemies you'll be fighting in the architecture, and that's it. We don't go any further than that. So you as a level designer then are assigned a number of these levels. So you might say, oh, okay, one of my tasks is Bleak Falls Barrow. It's a Draugr crypt in a Nordic ruin. Go. So this is basically just writing down your ideas. What would you like to do with that? What does Bleak Falls Barrow say to you? How are you going to make it unique? Now, we're not big fans of documentation. Uh, we do everything on the wiki. We usually like to keep documentation to 500 words or less. We just keep it very short. Uh, don't you know, give us a bunch of fluff. Uh, it helps us stay focused. And it helps us when we're writing a past zero pitch to focus on the thing that makes this level unique, right? Like, what is the thing that makes this Draugr Crypt different from the other 45 in the game? Which is a serious issue when you're making a game with 200 dungeons. A lot of times this will be some kind of novel gameplay. It's a story that we tell through a character you find. It's a sense of atmosphere in the level or a puzzle that I'm going to solve. But it can be something as simple as a visual idea, right? Something more abstract than that that you can then build upon and come back to. We also do a story pass on every single level in the game at this stage. And when I'm saying story here, what I do not mean is a book you will read or a conversation you'll have with an NPC. This is story which may never manifest to the player in an overt narrative way. These are, well, why was this place built? Oh, it's an ancient crypt. Okay, that's fine. What has happened here? Let's say 200 years ago, a group of political heretics would meet down here in secret to discuss their plans. And one day, the opposing party came down and bricked over the wall and left them to die. Okay, that's some good historical story. What now? Okay, the player arrives. So we talk about the current events. What's happening when the player arrives or just before? A group of bandits heard about this place and they've just broken through the wall and now angry political heretic ghosts are chewing on their bandit brains. Great, that's a good foundation, right? And it doesn't even have to be as specific or gameplay oriented as that particular example. It can be just, it was a crypt, people were buried here, and when the player arrives, it's a crypt. And that's okay too, because even though these stories may not be very overtly interesting, they provide background information for us, which informs all kinds of micro decisions that you make when you're building. How would this crypt be built? Why would it be here? And then you can start from a place of consistency when you're building the level on future passes. Something that's a little bit more pragmatic that we also do at this stage is generate a list of asset requests. Now, we're not concerned with making a list of every table and chair and rug 
that we want at this stage, but anything that's going to make yours unique, right? Like this particular guy was buried here and I'd like a headstone that says that. We get that stuff requested early because these are the sorts of things that will slip through the cracks because we have a lot of tables and chairs to make people. So we want to make sure that we have this custom one-off stuff accounted for somewhere so we don't forget about it, basically. So what we'll do now is we'll go through the entire list of dungeons in the game and we'll do a pass zero on every last one. The important thing here is that that takes time. That can take a couple of months, two, three, four months, before we're ready to move on. And when we move on, we want to do our layout pass. The thing that happens over those three or four months is that people are making the game. So at this point, now everyone is working on this game. The whole team is on board, production's ramping up, but the game isn't really much yet. It's still pretty vacant. You're probably running around as a character from the last game. There's not much in the world. But one thing that we do focus on right out of the gate is getting the dungeon kits built. So we have really, really brilliant, very fast, um, technically minded kit artists who build these kits which we use to construct all of the levels in the game. And one of our big priorities is making sure that we have these kits first thing. So we know that even if we're just using a really crummy looking hallway, that that hallway is going to work exactly that way forever and ever, amen, right? The pivot point stays in the same place. The edges of the bounding box stay in the same place. So I can work on a level that looks crummy now, and when I come back to it in a year, the art has been updated and it looks better, but I don't have to then go through and shuffle a bunch of things around to make it work. This is actually a lot harder than it sounds. Um, I did a whole talk about it at GDC last year. It's really, 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 really critical to our workflow because we can then build with confidence a complete layout at this stage based on our pass zero. When you're doing your first, first passes, this is also the time where we are learning how to use the kits, we're stress testing the kits, and we're working with the artists a lot to make sure that we're generating additional pieces, custom pieces, and getting all that stuff in. It means that the first passes go a little bit slow because we're actually making art as we go, but that's okay because again, we need to have some time for the game to develop under the hood as we are doing our work, setting the groundwork for future passes. One of the things, the main thing we can do meaningfully at this pass is think about the basic rhythm of flow. Now again, this is not the pacing in terms of the action because we have nothing to make the action with yet. It hasn't been built. But we can start to create the framework in which it will happen. We can get a sense, this big room is an arena where I'll have a big, you know, momentous combat. Or this is a narrow hallway where something is going to jump out and block my passage and I'll have to t deal with it. This is also a good time to determine the connectivity of things. Uh, this is sort of particular to open world games where everything is sort of interconnected. And so we have to start thinking early on about where is this in the world? How does it connect to other things? How does it fictionally connect with other things? There's no reason we can't do this early, so we try and do it very early and get a holistic sense of what the game world is going to be like. So this is a screenshot of what a first pass level looks like. Uh, this is Bleak Falls Barrow. It's just a particular room. And boy, that looks bad, right? Like, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, the lighting's not so good. but. It's just really basic art. It's just a square. There are maybe three assets used to make the whole room, and that's it. It's nothing to write home about, but it tells us enough information that we can move forward with confidence based on what we have now. So the second pass then is where we focus on encounters. Now, where is the game when we start working on second passes? The core mechanics of the game, running, jumping, you know, stabbing and looting, all that stuff is now taking shape, it's solid, we can kind of play the game. In fact, if you play the game just right, it's even kind of fun, it even sort of looks like a game. If you do one thing wrong, it doesn't anymore, but it's starting to resemble a video game and that's a nice time to start getting into thinking about the encounters because usually we'll have sort of the one main enemy type that you'll see a bunch in the game and then a couple of main weapon types that you'll see a bunch in the game and we can start working with that while the rest of that stuff starts coming online. So the thrust of our interest on this pass then is getting in enemies, spawning them, setting up on patrols and at this point we can also start doing things like little scenes where you can eavesdrop on guards and having a conversation. You can start laying all of that in and get a sense of the real encounter experience of the space. On a technical side, this means that now we have to do AI pathing support. We use nav mesh at Bethesda, which is sometimes tedious and takes time to build. But again, we need it now, you do it now, and it becomes easier to modify it later than to do it wholesale later. So it's a good time to start. And also, even though we only have the very basic core sort of combat gameplay at this stage, it's good to think about the non-combat beats you would like to use and get placeholders in for that. Sometimes this involves scripting, and so if you're scripting a puzzle, we're only concerned about what game developers call the golden path. Golden path essentially means the way you're supposed to play it, 
where we don't worry about like a hostile player who's trying to break the game or doesn't really understand what to do. And it's okay at this stage if the scripting and the puzzle just totally falls apart under that kind of stress. That's not the point. What we want now is sort of the minimum amount of work you can do to prove the idea. And if the idea works and we like it and we agree upon it, we can move forward with the confidence that you can polish it up later. But we don't spend a bunch of time waterproofing it now because if the, if the puzzle stinks, then you lose all that work and we don't want to do that more than we have to. This is also when we start doing housekeeping passes on the game. Uh, some of this might be gameplay checklists like, hey guys, alchemy benches now work, can we start putting them in the dungeons? Okay, as we start going through second pass, we'll start working that stuff into our levels. This is also a good time to do occlusion optimization, which is essentially um, a very manual process of setting up the game so that it knows what to draw. And you can't really do this until you're confident in the layout, which after we've done our second pass, we know that the layout's pretty good. We did it in the layout pass, it stood up to the encounters pass, and now we can take some time doing this. And again, this is totally an eat your Wheaties thing. You don't have to do it. The game's not gonna run at low frame rate because there's no art yet. But doing it later will take more time later, and that's opportunity time that we don't want to eat into. So do your homework early, and then we can get to the fun stuff later. So the same room shot at second pass, we've got a little bit more art we start dropping in loot. You can see a treasure chest there. We have a bad guy, the place he hides in the corner, that little blue thing, and the trigger that spawns him. But again, it's still not much. It still doesn't look great, but it has the information we need. So pass three is what we call content complete. And again, that's not really the best term for it. What we call pass three around the office is shipping with shame, all right? Because this pass is all about getting the level done. Done and good are not the same thing but we want to make sure that it's done. And if you put a gun to our head, yes, we could ship the game, but we would not be proud of it. So the game at this point is pretty flushed out. All the core systems are functional. They're starting to get balanced and polished. Most of the art in the game is there. There's probably still some like quest specific and big set piece unique art, but most of the art we need is present. And if you squint just right and at the right time of day, you can see the finish line just at the edge of the horizon, which is a fun moment as a game developer because it's nice. One day this will be over and it's terrifying because you have so much work left to do. So again, the big thrust of what we want to do in pass three is make sure that nothing remains which is temporary or missing, right? If it's within the level designer's power to make sure this thing works as functional, you better make sure you do it. And if you can't, if it's outside of your power, this is when we sort of triple check that somebody is going to provide the art asset or the code feature that you need. We know who's going to do it and when, and there's kind of a date on that. So we know when we can come back and integrate that feature into the level. But we have 100% confidence that the level will get done, and we'll get everything it needs. We don't have to worry about making cuts or scope reductions. This is also a good time to start reacting to feedback you have gotten. Now, the important thing here is that Game developers, whether you're programming or an artist or a designer, love to blow stuff up because the longer you work on it, the more you hate it. And when you come back on something, you tend to just want to throw sticks of dynamite underneath and get rid of it and start over. And what you'll often end up with is something which is different but not necessarily better. And so we really, really try and avoid that reflex. And one way we do it is by collecting feedback, looking for trends in the feedback, and then reacting to those things specifically. So by BAS 3, You've looked at this thing a couple of times, people have played it, and you've kind of had time to sleep on it, and now you can be more pragmatic and practical about the reactions you choose to take to that feedback. Other stuff that we do at Path 3 is we start refining any of the activities, things a player does, little quest activities, scenes, uh, again, guards eavesdropping or having a conversation. We want to get that dialogue there, get it better. Uh, any custom AI handling. At pass two, it's okay to walk in a room there's just two guys with swords standing around. But at pass three, we want to think about these guys are sleeping in their beds or they go on patrols or when a fight breaks out, this guy's going to run over and ring an alarm. This is the sort of stuff you want to start doing at pass three. Also, any detail scripting. Remember when I said it was okay that your shaky puzzle didn't really work on pass two? Now that's not okay. Now we want to go through, we say, we know this puzzle's going to work, we know it's kind of cool, we're going to get you the art assets, and we want you to script it to, in fact, be bulletproof and not break down. This is also where we start doing loot and balance passes. A lot of this is just getting on the same page as the system's design goals. Just like a piece of art or a piece of code, the system's designs of the game aren't really done until midway through the game. So we might take out, you know, um, 
you know, like we could have cut lock picking, right? And it's like now we need to like remove all the lock pick stuff from the game, or maybe lock picking is really great and we need more of it. We'll do passes now where we basically make the levels tell the truth about the system design, so that those gameplay opportunities and those systems are well represented within the levels as we're polishing them up on pass three. So a third pass dungeon, you can see every time it just picks up a little bit more art but it's still rough. It's still not something that you would want to ship, even though technically speaking it is complete enough that nothing breaks and nothing's missing, and you can in fact play through the whole game. So then there's the beauty pass, which is fun for level designers because we don't actually do the work. Here's why. The game at this stage is nearing content complete for the whole game. Now content complete is a stage where everything is in, and we're trying to slow down the rate at which new stuff goes into the game. The big reason for this is that as a game nears completion, programming needs a standardized baseline to work from. They need to know that if they make a big change to how the rendering works and it crashes in the build the next day, it's because of their change and not because of like 5,000 new pieces of art that went in. So as a result, art now is spending a lot of their time play testing and polishing but not generating new content, which makes them available <coughs> to help level design out with our beauty passes. So this involved things like going through and doing the real lighting of the spaces, which we avoid doing early, adding in additional clutter, filling the space with visually interesting things, any atmospherics and effects, and then a sound pass. As a level designer, you're really not doing much of the work, but you are part of the conversation. And one of the things you're doing is you're keeping an eye on the performance. One of the best things anybody, whether you're modding or making games professionally, you can do is to test on crummy hardware, like get the minimum uh, system specs and play on that, and just make sure that all those beautiful shadow lights that are going in aren't killing your frame rate and making your level run like garbage. Also a good time to do visibility optimizations. As new clutter goes in, you're gonna have frame rate issues or poly count issues that you didn't have before, and you can go and start tweaking and refining the, uh, the visibility bounds that you put in all the way on pass two. And so once the art pass is complete, now it's starting to look like something you could ship and write home to mom about. It's got all the art, it's got effects, it's pretty, it's lit, the sounds are creaking as you move around the space, and it's starting to feel like a real proper video game, which is cool. But it's actually not really good yet, and that's where we get into the final passes. And you'll note here that I don't use fourth pass, right? Like if you've, been, if you've been keeping up at home, like it doesn't always add up to four. We might spend five or six passes. And those again are targets of opportunity where we know that this level is struggling and it needs a little extra tension. But this level is actually really good. And if we can just do a little bit more and pump it up to 11, we can make this thing really sing. So that's what we're trying to do. Because at this point, the game is about done. By the time we finish our final passes, the game is or really ought to be done and headed for Gold Master, which is basically the build of the game that's ready to be sort of put on discs and uploaded to Steam and good to go. Not much after this pass can be changed. Remember, we need to have a solid baseline and have a game that doesn't have a lot of variables for what might crash. So at this point now, when you're done with your final pass, if you want to make a change to your level because you don't like it, tough cookies. You're not going to get to make that change because we need to ship the game. But if you want to make a change because it's uh, what we call a showstop or something that like crashes the game or prevents progress, then you get to change that. But that stuff only. So one of the big things you need to do leading up to and through your final pass is just get as much feedback as humanly possible and make small tweaks. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater anywhere near the final pass. So like overhauls and revisions need to be very micro and focused towards making it better. Because making something good from scratch is never as easy as making something a little bit better that's been built on piece by piece over time. So the other number one thing you can do then is just find bugs and get those things tracked and get those things fixed. And then after you finish doing that, you should find some more bugs and get those ones tracked and get those ones fixed. And then you're finally ready to find all the bugs because there, there are some bugs. And if you don't fix them now, you don't get to fix them. And that really drives you to where you end up because that's it. Like at Bethesda, we still make very traditional games that we finish and put in a box and they're pretty much done, right? That's forever, that's permanent. Like that's the legacy you leave. And if you don't do it a way that you can be proud of when you have the chance, you're gonna be upset about that. You're gonna be sad about that every time you look at that game or that level again. And that's kind of where I wanna leave you guys because you can go into any game store in the country and look at any game on the shelf and pull it off. And if you go through the credits and you start calling those people up and you ask them, was it done? Was it as good as it could possibly be? No. There's always more to do. 
In video games, you can always make it better. People who make video games could honestly probably make a better living with less stress doing anything else with those same skills. But we choose to do it because we love it. We want to make something great for people. But when you're doing that, it's very easy to get lost, where you spend all your time fixating on these little things you can make better and polishing up. And in the end of the day, you lose sight of the big picture. You lose sight of the player, and you become engrossed in the developer self that is not going to make the best progress for the overall game. So developers need to learn to do the best you possibly can while you can do it. Because it's very easy to make games in an, an unhealthy way. You know, you hear about crunch culture, you hear about people sleeping under their desk, which I've done, you know, after being in the office for three days. And the diminishing returns on that come very quickly, where you're not making the best stuff. And even though you're working really hard, and that's really admirable, I guess, you're hurting yourself, and oftentimes the work you're doing is subpar, and you're hurting the game. There's a finite amount of time you have to work on these games. And when you work on big games, like, like I do, where they take three or four years to build, it's not long in your career before you sit down and you kind of do the math of how many you have left, right? And I want to leave something that I'm proud of. I hope you do too. And I want to make sure that we all are as quick as possible to go out, make great things, be happy, be healthy, and make other people happy. And that's what I have to say about that.